afternoon. I'm an Indigenous woman from Winnipeg, Manitoba. I'm a band member of Kisikun and First Nation, and my spirit name is Mayangan Ogichita Kwe, which means wolf warrior woman in the Ojibwe language. <laughs> Many of you might not know what a spirit name is because it sometimes sounds mythical. I think the first time that I heard of a spirit name was probably through a joke and it was being phrased Indian name. The truth of Indigenous people was not always taken seriously. This is how we're taught to think of Indigenous people. The same reason that when I saw a chief in a headdress that I didn't understand what it meant to be a chief in a headdress or what it meant to be an Indigenous woman. I grew up in one of the poorest areas in our city, in Winnipeg's North End. And in my neighborhood, when I was young, grown men would expose themselves to me and my friends, and men would stop in their cars and ask if we wanted to go for a ride. I have a story of a guy that I had a crush on when I was 16, hold a knife to my throat and tell me that now I belong to him. But those are not the stories that I'm here to tell you today. This is what I want to share with you. There was a time when I was 27 years old, I was a mother of two, and I had a day off of work. And so I did what any other mom would do on her day off of work. I took the kids to daycare and did errands. On that afternoon, I stopped by my mom's house. My mom, my grandma, and my aunt were chatting in the kitchen. And my aunt was sharing that she heard that the police had shot a young man a few blocks down that afternoon. And so my mom, my grandma, and my aunt were accounting for all of the men in our family, cousins, brothers, and uncles. And the only person that was accounted for at that time was my brother Matthew, who was 18 years old. And I thought, moms worry so much. Why do they think that has anything to do with us? Later that evening, feeling pretty accomplished because I got my kids into bed by 9 p.m., I was folding laundry by the light of the lamp, and the phone rang. And I called display so I could see that it was my mom. And I answered the phone, and I said hello, but the sound that came from the phone I didn't recognize. I was trying to figure out if she was laughing. What is that sound? Eventually, after she took a deep breath, she let out the words, that was your brother. And I knew what she was telling me in that moment, that that cold winter afternoon, that the police killed my little brother. This was not the first time that we had tragedy in our family, but it was the first time that it was on the front page of the news for days, and it was the first time that it was on the 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news. And it was only after that, which was the first time that I attended a chief summit, and I was told to stand for the grand entry. This is the first time that I saw a chief in a headdress. And I thought, a chief in a headdress? I thought that was almost fictional, a fairy tale or a legend. And I didn't know why I didn't know this, and I was embarrassed that I didn't know this, and I didn't tell anybody. But I started asking questions and just observing different things that were going on. Something else that was new from the community was that for the first time, the community was embracing us in a new way that I had never experienced. Me and my family were receiving gifts of sweet grass, eagle feathers, and honor songs. And again, I didn't know what any of those things meant, but they were giving it to us with so much love. So obviously my life changed, my work changed. I wanted to do something that I felt was more meaningful for me. And this was the first time that I started working with Aboriginal people. I was working in an Aboriginal organization. And the people that I was working with were a lot like me, and their families were a lot like mine. And for the first time, I started to feel like I belonged and I didn't even know that I was missing that. But my identity of who I was was coming clearer. These are the gifts that my brother Matthew gave to me. It was the awakening of learning who I really am with a 
desire to really succeed because Matthew didn't have that chance. I help our nation, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, learn about the history of the relationships between Indigenous people and the government. And I help them understand as I learn why some things are the way that they are. You see, government created specific policies and they tried their best to prevent me from ever knowing about my relatives, my spirit name, and my connection to everything. They used federal strategies like banning traditional practices, which sometimes meant destroying communities. And they forced residential schools, where starting in 1883, families were threatened and forced to send their kids to kill the Indian in the child. And when these kids grew up, it happened to their children. And when their kids grew up, it happened to their children. And their children and their children for generations. This ended in 1996. I was born in 1978. When were you born? Still today, Indigenous children through education, health, and justice are greatly discriminated. Our jails have the highest Indigenous rates, and so does the child and, fa uh, child and family system. Our populations are young and growing, and some improvements have been made, but there's still so much work that needs to be done in our communities and in our everyday discussions. Much of the work is education because a strong country knows their history, good and bad. And I'm so thankful for the work that I do because, again, it's so meaningful to me that at the end of a session, when people are asking me questions like, why didn't I know this? How do I share this? And what can I do now? Losing my brother to a police shooting could have caused me, caused me to hate government, hate law enforcement, but instead I was open to asking and learning why. Why were things the way that they were? Why were Indigenous people treated so badly? And why did law enforcement have to be so extreme and so final? I wanted to be part of the solution because I still believe in a better way. I didn't want this to happen to anyone else's brother or cousin or relatives. Losing a loved one is one of the hardest things that you'll ever have to face. Loss can bring you down and hold you down in pain. I actually explored joining the police academy and <clears throat> attending the RCMP depot was probably one of the most fascinating days of my life. I held a fake gun in a gun simulator, but I could never imagine myself aiming that at another human being. Policing just wasn't for me. But I have some very special people in my life that are in law enforcement. You know what some of the most meaningful experiences for me in this journey has been? Is listening to people's stories, is taking time to really listen, not judging people, but really listening for the sake of their healthy expression. Because when we hear people's stories, we begin to care, we begin to understand, and that's how you build community, and that's how you can strengthen a nation. It was after my brother's death that I also found the power in advocacy. I learned that when you're helping others, you learn it's okay for you to ask for help. And you learn that you're not the only one suffering because we're stronger together. Our country is in a time of reconciliation and everyone wants to know what is the answer to reconciliation? What is the solution or how will we know when we've been reconciled? One thing I know for sure is that it's not an event, it's not a conclusion or a project, but it's about relationships. It's when we can all be open to new answers and everyone can have knowledge, safety and autonomy in their own identity. Thank you.